I'm Alan Wardis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think People. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Zaragoza. But resilience also recognizes, as you said, that there's a problem that we are facing and that we are deep in the midst of that is daily, hourly, secondly getting worse, and that we need to gather the tools necessary to work with one another in order to shape the world in a way that we can actually make it sustainable. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. If you like Think People, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Think Planet, conversations with thought leaders on important environmental issues. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Zaragoza. Dr. Zaragoza holds a PhD in American Studies from Washington State University and is currently a professor of political economy at Evergreen State College in Tacoma, Washington. There he presents a course that he calls Neoliberalism in the Neighborhood, which is an attempt to teach people to recognize the ways in which a truly globalized economy uh, affects us much closer to home than we typically realize, and and also to provide tips for what to do about that. Anthony is an organizer and supporter of something called the Resilience Studies Consortium, a group of universities coming together to leverage shared energy and expertise in the pursuit of better ways to live on the planet. Anthony, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with you, Alan. Well, I like sometimes to start conversations by laying a little groundwork with some definitions. Please. And, and, and one is this word resilience that has come to stand in for um, sustainability, I think. Yeah. Sustainability got, got a lot of use there. And now we've kind of shifted to this idea of resilience. And I like this definition that's on the, um, the consortium website that says resilience is the capacity of an individual, community, or system to recover quickly from difficulties. Right. And one of the reasons I like that uh, is because it acknowledges the difficulties. That's right. How do you feel about that definition, and is it one that you work with? It is definitely one that I work with, Alan. I appreciate you laying it out for your readers and viewers right up front. And I do think it's not just a replacement for sustainability, but it's an expansion of it, right? Mm -hmm. In what ways? Well, sustainability um, has us recognize what are the things that we need to do for long-term systems thinking. But resilience also recognizes, as you said, that there's a problem that we are facing and that we are deep in the midst of that is daily, hourly, secondly getting worse and that we need to gather the tools necessary to work with one another in order to shape the world in a way that we can actually make it sustainable. And what I like about resilience is, and even the way I think about sustainability, it's not only an environmental or ecological concept. Right. That resilience goes far beyond that, both because it's a term that comes out of psychology, right? Right, and the, the ability of individuals to handle uh, right. trauma and so forth. And we can learn from that concept, both in terms of economics, political economy, as well as environmental thinking, as well as organizing communities and systems for sustainable futures, to recognize that we are in the midst of some deep and serious crises, but we don't have to just accept them, that we can work together and find solutions to those crises on local, national, and global levels. Yeah, and that's the other thing I like about the definition because right up front it implies that that's possible. That's right. That Yeah, okay, tough times. We've got difficulties to face, some of them really deeply entrenched and, and hard to even think about. But we can. Resilience says we can 
That's right. organized to, to make a difference. And for me, long before the term resilience was used, various communities, peoples of color, poor and working class peoples, were forced by the economic conditions and the living situations that they were in to constantly be ever resilient long before the name was applied to them. So one of the things that I think the Resilience Studies Consortium, as well as the resilience movement in this country, um, does needs to do and needs to build on are all the different strategies, tactics, and mechanisms that communities of color and poor and working class communities in this country and around the world have already been doing. Wait, you mean we don't have to recreate the wheel every time for every application? Not at all. I was actually <laughs> just at a panel um, by Tacoma Roots, a grassroots environmental justice organization, an anti-racist environmental justice organization in Tacoma, Washington. Mm -hmm. And one of the panelists said, conservation, well, that wasn't a thing for us. That was something that we did as a practice well, yeah, because we had to. By necessity. Yep. You just simply didn't throw the food away. You, you found some use for it, including composting for the garden or whatever. And that's just one small example. And, and what we see is that this resilience thinking there are so many different traditions within that that we can draw on, learn from, gather, collect, and build on. And thinking that exactly like you said, we do not have to recreate the wheel. That these strategies, that these mechanisms within communities have already been existing and that we can learn from each other. And that's where the notion of solidarity comes, comes in. Because we have been doing this work in various communities around the country. Now, what does it look like to share those strategies, tactics, and mechanisms and learn from each other and then think about how they apply to the particular place that we live in? Because mm -hmm. we're not talking about cookie cutter stuff. No. Where I just do what you do. Right, of course. We're talking about how do I learn from what you've been doing mm -hmm. and then think about with my community members how we apply it where we are and mold it and form it to shape the conditions that we live in. Well, in the, and in the process, we'll be forming common ground with each other. That's right. That's that right. That applies to political conversations and, That's right. and other, other ways in which we currently appear to be divided. You know, one of the things that's always amazed me uh, in talking with people who do work in some of the poorest communities around the world, they, they go in on mission trips or, or, or whatever, Peace Corps volunteers, a good example, they always comment on how happy people are in some of these places where they have nothing. And so I wonder about that definition of resilience also. You already alluded to it, right. the psychological definition. Right. If in the process of looking at how other communities, challenged communities, are solving some of these problems, are you finding that we can also learn how to sort of raise that happiness index that we hear about so often? Is it a better way to live, not just a, a safer or more um, sustainable one? Well, I think one way to think about it is not that these communities have nothing, right? They have been denied and had taken from them various kinds of material things that we prize so much in this culture mm. and economy. Right. But what they have been able to achieve in their communities is more of a communal mindset. And we're, we don't want to romanticize folks either no, because no, there is lots of struggle going on. Sure. But there is a social solidarity in which people are recognizing that they're in something together and that only together can solutions be put forth. So that communal kind of thinking that we see is a real basis that we can develop in all kinds of ways. And so the question for us is, given the economics and poli political history of this country that has been based on lots of different wedges, what the ruling class in this country has been very good at is finding and discovering and using the different wedges that bring us apart. Giving this group just enough to raise them above another group, give that group the, just this much more so that it becomes stratified and dividable. And we should be thinking about how do we duck and dodge, navigate and negotiate the various 
wedges that are thrown our way and to recognize there's plenty for us to talk about in terms of the differences in our situations, but that those don't necessarily have to divide us. But we have to be honest and open about what those differences are and what they look like and how we can be in solidarity with one another in ways that um, is equitable. And that together, in that way, we move together. Because I'm a big believer, Alan, that in order to make change, we need to find, join, and uh, build organizations for social change and to network those together. Not so that each tells the other what to do, but that we inform each other, share with each other, and build on each other's successes as we move forward. Well, and so that implies that... um a place to start is to realize that we have a choice whether we participate in this sort of wedge strategy that's, that's right. being used against us. We don't have to go there. That's right. We don't have to pick up those uh, d- divisions that are handed to us. How do you get past that, though? Some of these wedges are ones that we've lived with for a very, very long time and you know, are sort of embedded in deep memory now. Right, and invented and reinvented and reformulated. And on top of all that, there are plenty of ways in which we get studied and our metadata gets studied and mm-hmm. the wedges get sharpened and perfected. And so part of it for me, Alan, is that we recognize that they're there and that we don't pretend that they're not. So we have honest and open conversations about the power differentials in the society, its history, Uh and that we build relationships in struggle together in order to overcome them. I don't think it's simply about talking through them. I think it's actually taking action together and recognizing who a common enemy may be as we move forward together. And that takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of conversation. It takes a lot of patience. And it takes a lot of being with each other. Mm -hmm. It takes something uh, tangible to do, too. It's not just about uh, headspace, really. That's right. When you're talking about something that we do together, I think you're talking about community gardens. You're talking about housing um, that is a shared goal, um, that sort of thing. All of this sort of brings us to the next definition that I want you to share, and that is the word neoliberalism. Right on. Because, <clears throat> uh, you, you know, you said your course is called Neoliberalism in the Neighborhood. And that's, that's almost, that, that's a really intriguing uh, kind of juxtaposition. We think of neoliberalism as something that happens over there. Right. But your course suggests, no, it's, it's right here in the neighborhood. Define neoliberalism as you see it. And then take us through why you would uh, pair it so powerfully with local neighborhoods. Right. And I, and I really appreciate you seeing the global aspect of that. And that is something that many of the students recognize. And neoliberalism is a word that has, that is, has much more currency outside of the United States, right? Neoliberalismo in Spanish is a word that is much more spoken than neoliberalism is in English. Mm. And our, um, our comrades and colleagues to the south of us have a much deeper and more uh, involved understanding of it. And so well, I'm... They've been on the sharp end of it. That's more. right. Although we could also say that various communities here within the United States have also been on a very sharp edge of it, whether we're mm-hmm. talking about the ghetto, the barrio, or the reservation, places mm-hmm. that don't get the kind of attention that other aspects of U.S. culture do. And so it's really important to recognize also that there are pockets that have faced that blunt edge um, for 40 years and prior to that history, mm-hmm. right, who never got the benefits of the Keynesian welfare state and were in fact actively denied from those benefits. Neoliberalism turns it up up on those communities, and we see it very clearly here. So to think about defining it, I often say that neoliberalism is a word used to describe the package of economic policies, political priorities, and ideological justifications that create and enable the transformation of the economy. These policies redistribute wealth upwards while lowering wages, cutting the social safety net, and redesigning public institutions to facilitate profitability. This package of policies usually includes deregulation or what we might call re-regulation, because it's not simply the taking away of regulation, it's the reinventing regulation. Um, Also, the 
tax cuts and austerity measures that come down, the privatization, the rule of the market endlessly. And it's accompanied by political policies that handle the resulting economic polarization, labor precariousness, and instability through the growth of a kind of law and order state anchored in increasingly militarized policing, mass incarceration, and further military expansion. Wow, now that is a mouthful. Yes. So I want to challenge you a little bit. Yes. Because um, uh, people who are watching this on, on television will see that you were reading some of that. But yeah. our, our radio listeners couldn't see that. Um, and, and I doubt if you went into the barrio and you were going to try to talk to people about this and how it affects their lives, that you would use a, some of that language. If you had to just boil that down to what right. that means to average people just trying to get through the day, trying to pay the rent, trying to keep their kids in school, what does all of that mean for them? When I talk to family members, when I work with community members or I work within the neighborhood, I want to do two things. One, I want to start with the lived reality of the people that I'm talking to. Uh -huh. At the same time, I want to introduce terminology and names for the things that they're experiencing to know that this is a named thing that uh -huh. others around the country and around the world are experiencing. Good point. So I try to do a little bit of both, uh -huh. but I always start with a question, Alan, to get at this. And this is the basis of the Neoliberalism in the Neighborhood Research Project. It, it actually wasn't just a course. It turned into a series of courses uh -huh. and year-long research and uh -huh. decade-long research project of myself. I start with a very simple question. And that's, what are the changes that you've seen in your neighborhood over the last 20, 30, or 40 years? Mm, everybody can answer that. Exactly. And then we start to get the experience of looking at what those changes are. And I, I have a guided, often a guided tour that people go through their neighborhood doing with a series of questions that turns their attention Right? There's a whole thing about mindfulness now, right? And we turn our attention here within us and turn our attention there. We could think of this as a kind of social and communal mindfulness hmm. in which we turn our attention to particular things around us that we often take for granted and don't notice because they've become so normalized. So, for example, I ask folks to look at how is, where is the public space in your community and how is that public space used? How are private interests, for-profit interests, beginning to take over that public space? Where do you see it? Uh -huh. what, have, what are the forms of public art and public resistance that we see that are trying to reclaim that public space in a, in a kind of way? So I start with that question of what are the changes? And then as we have this conversation, we begin to recognize that there are patterns among these. And so my goal then is to start to name those patterns. And I offer some history about the actual policy policy changes that led to the real world changes in their neighborhood so that it wasn't just something that ha that happened but it was something that happened by design and something that happened by design not just here but around the country and around the world and so the next step obviously then once you've sort of taken stock and increased this mindfulness is to talk about so where do we go from here that's right what are the answers to that well as you know, there's no magic solution. Mm -hmm. It's not a pill that we take and we, tomorrow we wake up better. It is a recognition, first and foremost, of the situation that we're in and an analysis of the power relations in the community and finding out where are people's leverage points. What are the issues around which people can organize themselves and make demands? For example, in the hilltop community where our school is in Tacoma, Washington, we are seeing rapid, rampant, and unprecedented gentrification. And with that gentrification is the displacement of the traditional residents, uh, predominantly African American, though not exclusively, and overwhelmingly poor and working class folks who are having their community invaded by folks not from that place who are taking advantage of uh, new perks, taking advantage of lower prices, and are beginning mm -hmm. to move in and start businesses. And so one of the things that we're trying to get uh, ourselves to look at is 
Why is this happening? What are the city level policies that are enabling it? And where are our leverage points to begin thinking about it? And that doesn't mean that we blame the individuals who are coming in and who are buying properties. But we wor- we try to work with those folks to educate them that they're coming into a neighborhood that has history and that they're coming into the neighborhood often means someone else leaving the neighborhood. And this isn't simply about guilt, but it is about recognition of what's going on. And so gentrification is one issue around which people are organizing. Another is around tenants' rights, which is connected to that. And another is around uh, bus buses and having public transportation. So for us, it's finding what are the actual concrete issues in people's lives and getting folks to recognize that they can make some demands to get more from their city, from their state, and from their country. And we begin to recognize that the fight for busing, the fight for affordable housing, the fight for a $15 minimum wage or a livable wage, that in fact, when we scratch the surface, those are all connected to these policies of neoliberalism that we laid out. So we think we're fighting separate battles, but it turns out when we look at it that we're actually fighting the same battle on different fronts. Hmm. Well, and I find that interesting because all of those things you describe are found in every community, That's right. everywhere. That's I, right. I really don't care where you are. Uh, neighborhoods embedded in in big urban areas are facing the same sorts of pressures. Do you think that that there has been a a shift away from even the realization that there are level levers that individuals can can go and and try to pull to affect what's happening in their own neighborhoods? For instance, I mean most people have no idea that development in a new development in a neighborhood that's undergoing gentrification had to go through a planning commission. That's right. Had to had to be approved at various levels. Um, and there and that those commissions still involve public input process. That's right. Have we just lost the the knowledge that that's even available to us? Well, I think it's a combination of things, and and in that it's not just the the planning prop uh, the planning commissions. It's also the package of tax incentives that are public funds giveaways mm. to developers. And so there's both the planning, but there's also the economic incentives that are given. The political process. Absolutely. And so I think it's a combination of things. On the one hand. There are ways in which the various places that people can have uh, input are occluded, are um, uh, we're encouraged to go to sleep on, to find boring, to feel that we have no voice. So I definitely think that there are ways in which we're sidelined, both in terms of our own understanding of our input, but also in terms of the way that these go about. Including things as simple as when these meetings are held. That's right. When and (laughs) where. During the workday, for instance. That's right. And and the other part of that isn't just the occlusion. It's also the fact that in this neoliberal period, in order for folks to make a living, right, they're often working multiple jobs, which may include a wage labor job at a fast food restaurant that they then supplement with a gig economy job like uh-huh. an Uber or renting out a room. Uh-huh. So it's not only the fact that these things can be, we can be guided away from them, but we're also materially inhibited from participating due to the busyness uh-huh. that is created in order to just survive in this economy. So I, we have been trying to think about how do we free up time for each other in order to participate and how do we maintain a, 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 an organizing that keeps people at the center and their whole beings at the center so we don't blame each other if you can't show up. And so the idea there is I may not be able to go because of my work schedule, but somebody in my community organization can perhaps and represent our interests. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And then to bring that back to the community Mm -hmm. and then to have the community ideas, questions, and interests brought to. And I'm not saying we've got a lot of work to do in Tacoma as well as elsewhere to figure out how we do this, but we are taking baby steps toward working together, toward realizing the problem, and toward 
figuring out how we intervene. And so much of that, Alan, is about relationship building, Mm -hmm. being patient with each other, listening Mm -hmm. to each other, and hanging in through those uncomfortable moments where we reveal some of the truths about this society that we don't often talk about Mm -hmm. and don't like to hear. Mm -hmm. And so what I always tell, especially folks from dominant groups, whether white or male or cis um, or straight or whatever it may be, that you have to learn to be comfortable with uncomfortableness and invite that in and just get used to the tough conversations that need to be had. Do you make room for storytelling in that process? Because it seems to me that listening to each other's stories is a really great place to start. And here I'll talk about some of the work that we do at Evergreen Tacoma because our work is based and is fundamentally connected to storytelling. So in the very first quarter when students enter our two-year program, and we're a two-year BA completion, so students are coming to us having a 90 credits or an AA degree that we then help them to finish to get a BA. In the very first quarter that they have on our campus, they write memoirs. Mm -hmm. And those memoirs are a story from their life and this is usually in a small group of about 15 to 20 students. We work on that throughout the quarter of finding a way to tell that story. And then on the last day of the quarter, we read those memoirs to each other, including me. I always read a story that I've written to the students. And I'll tell you what, Alan, there's not a dry eye <laughs> in that that's room right. because they're stories of strength, they're stories of resilience, they're stories of the pain that exists in that room that we carry with us uh-huh. and that we all have. So in that sharing, first of all, it's an introspection and a reflection, but it's also a sharing. That builds these common bonds that are absolutely crucial. So memoir is crucial to what we do. I'll give you another example. My teaching partner and I, Dr. Gilda Shepard, who's a sociologist and a filmmaker. She's got an f- incredible film that is coming out soon about her work um, inside doing education in, and working with uh, prisoners. Mm. We have both taught classes at the Women's Correctional Center of Washington. And she and I are doing a class called This Is Us, researching stories of family resilience. Mm. And what we're doing now, building off of that memoir, is now looking at our family members, and we allow folks to define family how they want, as long as they have a a coherent definition of what they consider family. And then they ask about what were the tough times and how did you get through it? And so our goal is to gather up those stories of resilience to share with each other. So it builds off of that memoir piece of sharing a piece of you to sharing a piece of the struggles that you and your family have been part of and the things, the mechanisms that you've used to get through it. And we'll share those with each other. They'll write a research report, and then they'll do a translation of that into, say, a film or a podcast or a painting or a skit. Um, Hmm. or any number of kind of translations where they tell that story, the story of these stories, and share them not only with the the learning community in the class, but the learning community in the actual neighborhood and in our our larger uh, Tacoma society. That reminds me of the truth and reconciliation process that that South Africa undertook um, when Nelson Mandela became president. They recognized that Wow, listening to each other's stories was one way to avert some of the worst possibilities of of violence and so forth. Do you see, when you say there's not a dry eye in the room, do you see some of these wedges being dislodged uh, um, on a regular basis? And, And if so, give us an example. I would say that what we see is the beginning of the taking down of the wedges. But that's ongoing work. Mm. And keep in mind that our students, we have about 200 students, and they are poor and working class students all, right? Um, We're 60% students of color, 33% African American, uh, 10 to 15% Latinx. So we have a very diverse group um, of students. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of wedges there. But the one common basis that folks have is that they are poor and working class and have known struggle. So one of the things that the sharing of the stories does is to remind folks of those common struggles and to remind folks that there are some things that we have in common and that those are the things that we can build on. 
And that's an important thing for our students to recognize and, and think about as we do the work that we do. Um, in terms of examples, um, I, I think we see examples daily of people crossing over the, the wedgeable spaces um, to each other and to think together and be together. But it is it really is a two-year process that we go through. Mm. But I have seen incredible transformation, not only among the students, but also of us with as faculty, our staff, the community members that we work with, the community organizations. So we're all teaching each other about these things. And that's a, a kind of crucial thing. And when I set up that community uh, popular education workshop, I had people in all the different constituencies um, in different groups. And then for each activity, I would change those groups so that by the end of the two-day period, you had worked closely with nearly everybody and knew those folks by name. Mm -hmm. And so for me, one of the key things is getting past the rhetoric, getting past our own assumptions about each other, and actually just rolling up our sleeves and working together in some way. And I <laughs> actually think that that's one of the most important and powerful things that we can do. Well, and it's... it's um something that can be replicated no matter where you are. It, you're just talking about talking to each other. That's right. Identifying common yep. ground. Structured conversations. I would really like to hear your story. You're clearly very passionate about these things. Yep. You know a lot about about the problems, but also possible pathways forward. How'd you get here? How, how, where'd you come from? Like many of, uh, of our students, I was the first of my family to go to college. My parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents were steel workers in Northwest Indiana, Ham and Gary in East Chicago. And I saw during my middle school and high school period what we now call deindustrialization. Mm. I saw factories move. I saw factories get automated. I saw um, r the Rust Belt blossom in its way. And I had many questions about that. I couldn't understand what was going on. I saw members of my family go to prison. I saw members of my family get addicted to drugs, mm -hmm. crack, crank, mm -hmm. among various others. And I saw that happen around to the community. And so for me, it had lot, it left me with lots of questions as I was entering into college and then later into graduate school that I sought answers to. And my dad was real clear with me. He said, Tone, you're not going to find a job in these mills the way I did. Mm -hmm. The summer I graduated, I was working in one of those mills. That's not going to happen to those you. Those days are gone. So you better stay in school. And I took his advice, and I went to college. I went to graduate school. I got my Ph.D. in American Studies at Washington State University and have been an asking these questions since. So I'm driven very much by my concrete lived experience of seeing this happen and the results, seeing how many people died or went to jail from a high school while I was in college and having to wrestle with what does it mean for me to have the privilege of going to school and study in this beautiful place called Indiana University. Meanwhile, my brother, various friends from high school were being put into the penitentiary mm -hmm. and to think about that contrast. Mm -hmm. And I've been wrestling with that forever. And for me, what the thing that I've had to deal with is how do I get over this survivor's guilt? Because it's not about guilt. Because if we define the problem as guilt, we do all kinds of crazy things sure. to overcome that. Because the problem isn't guilt. The problem is this particular economic system and the impacts that it's had on people. Well, we're almost out of time, but I would love to hear you tell us about a moment where you realized that these changes that you saw in your community and in your family weren't just happening that they were happening by design and as a direct result of a very purposeful economic policy. When did you find that? When did that tumbler click into place and, and, and you say, wow? I don't know if there was one moment, but there were series of moments. And I remember asking my dad, my dad saying, you know, Tone, I'd, I'd love to be able to take you to a department store and shop for those nice clothes, but I just can't do it. That, f that formed an economic question for me. Well, you, you, we can't do it, but others can. Why is that? Mm -hmm. So the question of inequality was there and present in kind of material ways. Mm -hmm. um, but also seeing how many of my fellow classmates, parents were being laid off. Luckily enough, my father was a journeyman pipe fitter, and he would go from job to job as a union worker, and so he wasn't laid off. But I saw tons of people around me being laid off, and that's when it started to hit me that this wasn't right, 
and that it didn't have to be this way. It had There had to be another way. So I mm-hmm. went searching for answers. But it's interesting, Alan, as part of this neoliberalism in the neighborhood project, I was lucky enough to receive a grant from Evergreen to actually go back to my neighborhood mm-hmm. summer before last and do exactly the kind of research that I asked students to do. And I went throughout the area and looked at the different kinds of changes and economic answers that were being presented to us. When I was leaving, um, for college, and as the mills were beginning to melt, what we got were these casinos, not riverboat casinos like in Illinois, but Mm. these casinos on Lake Michigan that kind of skirted around the law. This then got other casinos, and I thought, whoa, this is an incredible way of solving an economic problem. So before when various work members will work across the assembly line from each other are now on opposite sides of a crack or of a craps table mm-hmm. or on the opposite side of prison bars mm-hmm. right and that contrast also crystallized for me various kinds of understandings but i was lucky enough to go back and study some of that wow what an opportunity last question clearly the only reason to do this kind of work to invest as much as you do is a sense of hopefulness that there, there is a way to move forward. What's your source of hope? Well, I, I believe in, in people, Alan, and I believe that we as people are together are strong, and I believe in the conversations that we're able to have. So mine comes from a kind of belief in people. Uh, and one person in particular I talk about is I have a 16-year-old daughter, hmm. and I remember she was in her mama's womb when September 11th, 2001 happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, what a different world she's going to be born into than the one in which she was even conceived of, let Mm -hmm. alone the one that I was born into. Mm -hmm. And so I began thinking about her, her future, and by extension, the future of all children. Because it's right now that those kids are growing. It's right now We are forming the world that they will inherit. And in that, we have a sense of, we have a certain responsibility um, to kind of give back, to find a way to build movement, and to enjoy each other's company as we grow the hope together. And I believe in people power. Couldn't agree with you more, brother. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate being with you. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think People.